I'm so delighted that shadow work is becoming popular because it's absolutely essential. Mm. Our survival may depend upon this work. And does it have to be one individual at a time for it to work? Is there a way for us to do shadow work on a more collective level? Well, I suspect you've played with this. We certainly have an integral zen. We do a lot of group shadow work. Um, yes, it is possible. Where it gets really complicated are where the collective shadows, the group shadows, like the green shadow, starts interfering with the shadow work you're doing with individuals. Can you expand on that a little bit? How does that look? Well, yes. Um, I don't know. Let's, let me just approach this without using any technical jargon. Yeah. But um, I'm a Zen master. I have a rather authoritarian leadership style, which actually, I mean, there's all kinds of psychological reasons for that, but we don't need to go into those. I'm happy to, but we don't need to. I'm a lightning rod for projections from this green collective shadow where authoritarian hierarchical leaders are taboo. That is a collective shadow. And I'm a lightning rod for that shadow. I get it all the time. So in order for me to survive and have green students come in, we have to have collective ways of dealing with this collective shadow. And we've developed some. Some collective shadow work, some group shadow work, where we, we really talk about these shadows and we work on them. And we help people become conscious of them. One of the practices we have called embodying Zen. And it has to do with only talking about things that are immediately experienceable by your senses. So this is the collective agreement. And we sit in a circle and we go around the circle and we say something. But it has to be something that's happening in real time. And the input has to come from our five senses. And what becomes immediately evident is how important people's stories are. Because if you're talking about only things that you can immediately experience, you're not pulling anything out of your mind or any emotions out and telling a story about it because that's not real time. <laughs> that's a form of group work that is really effective at helping people see and realize for themselves how addicted to their stories they are. And it's a great beginning. Right. So certainly we, we went there from there's the individual level, someone doing shadow work mm -hmm. by themselves. Mm -hmm. We can do it as a group. But in terms of a wider culture, because there's millions of people out yes. there, and a lot of them, uh, well, a lot of us I, we don't go to these types of groups. Yes. So I'm, I'm curious around, do you see any way that a culture as a whole can start to look at its shadow? Or does, is, does it have to be done face to face? Nature has a way of, of helping us with these problems. When great shadows accumulate, it's called war. Do you know what causes peace? Tell me. War. Is that the only way? Well, so far. <laughs> In this massive a scale that you're talking about. I don't think we're evolved enough to do it on this massive a scale. So nature takes care of it for us. Interesting. And um, one of the things that gives me great hope is we may have to find a way to do this to survive. When do we change, as my teacher always asked. And then his answer was, when we have to. Certainly been true in my development, yeah. Um, you're talking about war. There's another question I wanted to ask you, which was around just death in general in our culture. Yes. Death seems to me, and always has, 
to be one of the only certainties we have. And I find I take great solace in that. There's a certainty and through meditation practice also, meditation is related to death. Um, what do you think the shadow that we seem to have around death in our culture does throughout the culture? We avoid it, like the plague. <laughs> I do a lot of death and dying work. You know, Zen is known for its relationship with death. We say, die before you die, so that you can live. I do a workshop that I love to do because death is a Dharma gate. You know, we were talking about meditation being the old standard way. There's actually a more effective Dharma gate than meditation. It's called a brush with death. It's a huge opportunity to open into the great mystery. So I start this workshop with a question. Isn't it interesting that we all know we're going to die? Do you know you're going to die? Yeah. And none of us believe it. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Why is that? What is going on here? So this body's going to die. I'm fairly certain that's true. Yeah, there seems to be overwhelming evidence that tells me my body's going to die. I'm also fairly certain my precious ego is going to die because it's connected to the body. What is it that was never born and perhaps will never die? If we cut away all your thoughts, all your feelings, all your stories, if we ask you, who are you really? And every time you answer, I hold up the mirror and say, I ask you who you are and you tell me what you think. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Can you go deeper than thought? And you do. You go deeper than thought and you find what you feel. And I say, interesting. First you tell me what you think, then you tell me what you feel. Can you go deeper than feelings? And eventually, as you said, your mind will tie itself in knots. What did you call it? A thought bomb? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thought bomb will go off and there'll be nothing there. And you'll tell me the truth. That you don't really know who you are. And then we get excited. Now we're getting nowhere, finally. <laughs> and we look into the mystery. This don't know mind is what knows. We call it not knowing mind. This is I know mind. Problematic. Arrogant. This is don't know mind. And ironically, this mind doesn't know shit. <laughs> and this mind is open, mm. honest, vulnerable, and knows a great deal. It knows that this awareness that's looking out through these eyes into those eyes, those eyes into these eyes, this awareness was never born and will never die. It changes bodies like you change clothes. How many times was this awareness abandoned in the forest and eaten by wolves? And how is that related to your fear of being abandoned? <laughs> Now we're getting nowhere, mm. fast. And the Dharma gate to the mystery begins to open. So that, that process you're just describing, so Ken Wilber talks about showing up, cleaning up, growing up, and waking up. Waking up. So that sounds to me like a, a waking up process. What, what I'm struck by is that people like Jordan Peterson have had a very strong grow up message and I guess a clean up message, look at your stuff, your clean out, look, yeah, clean, clean out your shadows. shadows. Yeah. Um, what do you feel the culture needs right now of those or is it all of them? Is there anything particular that 
the culture is begging for? All of them. Mm -hmm. And we've added one more. Mm -hmm. It's essential to wake up. This mm -hmm. is the most important thing because this is what ends the war. Mm. Growing up, continuing to evolve is also essential. If you stay stuck and unevolved, you stay stuck and unevolved. Mm. <laughs> you stay where you are. The one that we've added right here is fucking up. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've learned everything I know by making mistakes. If I can't fuck up, I can't learn. I'm terrified of not fucking up. Now, if I am shopping for a brain surgeon, I want one that already knows. I don't want one that's in the fucking up stage. <laughs> And if I'm shopping for a Zen master, there's some truth to there too. Mm. If I'm shopping for a therapist, but I don't want one that's so rigid they're unable to take risks mm. and work with me, mm. that they're, they're terrified of fucking up, because you are going to fuck up. That's why the next one, cleaning up, is important. As soon as you realize you fucked up and you've learned what's going to be helpful, for you to continue, then you clean it up very quickly, as efficiently as possible. And only then can you show up as a fully awake, evolved, compassionate human being. So all of those processes, the, the, the waking up, the showing up, the growing up, the fucking up, mm -hmm. all of them have a developmental quality to them. All of integral is all a developmental model we are moving towards something and evolution and development is core to existence. I think that's one of the great gifts of um, what Integral has shown. Um, we, we've often talked amongst ourselves around uh, that the developmental model isn't so present in the cultural conversations that we're covering often with the intellectual dark web. It is a bit with Jordan Peterson. He talks about, for example, Piaget. Why is something like integral important? Why is it important to see the world developmentally, do you think? Um, I think it's critical to move out of I'm right and you're wrong space. The whole problem with all what are so-called first tier levels of development, which is through green, is that they all believe they're right and everybody else is wrong. Nobody's that smart. <laughs> what happens when you go beyond that is you can see that this is an evolutionary sequence and that one stage is more right than the stage before it. And the stage after it is more right than the stage before it. And the stage after it is more right than the stage before it. What gets real tricky is as Piaget was so good at displaying, the capacity to see and evolve has to happen. And the way to look at this is to look at it that when the ego first shows up, that's a first person perspective. I'm not capable yet of taking a second person perspective. If if I show this to a three year old, I say, What color do you see? Black. What color do you see? White. What color do I see? White, but the three-year-old says black. Yeah. Yeah. There's no ability to um, abstractly take a second-person perspective mm. and theoretically see what I'm seeing. That doesn't happen until about five or six years old. Mm. And that's where we start getting enculturated into our parents' belief system. So this is really an important thing to understand. If the capacity to see isn't there, a second person perspective, there's no way I can teach you to do that. You have to evolve the capacity. The third person perspective, which happens about puberty, 
and happened in the Enlightenment in our culture. This has the capacity for uh, operational thinking, right? Now we can abstract rules. They don't have to be concrete. They can, they, they, they can be more abstract and I can theorize. The scientific method is born. If I only have a second person perspective, like common people in the Middle Ages, there's no possibility that I could develop a scientific methodology. I don't have a third person perspective. Now, to move into postmodernity, what we're referring to as the green altitude, you have to have a fourth person perspective, which is you have to be capable of seeing systems theory. And you see the whole system in which the third person perspective is embodied in. That's a fourth person perspective. The reason Trump can't see the environmental problems is he does not have the capacity to take a fourth person perspective. He can't see the whole system that these problems are embedded in. And that's been true of many scientists until the evidence is so overwhelming that they can no longer argue with it. It's true of businessmen. They don't see the problem. They don't take a systems view. They don't have the capacity, no matter how intelligent they are, to take a fourth person perspective. Now the fifth person perspective is the evolutionary perspective. And very few people have the capacity to see the evolutionary nature of these perspectives. So you can preach, you can talk, you can twist their arm, you can insult them, you can bribe them, and nothing helps until they've evolved to the point where they're ready and they have the capacity. So my final question is, what is what do you feel is the main thing standing in the way of us taking that step, taking that evolution to that kind of perspective as a species right now? Um, this is a really important question. And to answer this question, it's really important to understand the difference between an individual holon and a social holon. Can you explain what a holon is for any viewers yeah. who haven't heard? A holon is a whole system. It's a functioning system. You're a holon. I'm a holon. Our Sangha, our integral Zen community, your rebel wisdom community, is a social holon. Now there's a really important difference between an individual holon and a social holon. And an individual holon has a dominant mode, uh, a dominant monad. You have an individual ability to make a decision. Now your body is a holon, and it includes this ability to make decisions. If you decide to walk out that door, you can't leave your hand here without radical surgery. Now, if this group of people assembled here today, if you decide to walk out that door, you can walk out that door. A social holon doesn't have the same limitations as a, your, the, your body is a holon. Uh, you know, a flock of geese is flying south. One goose can fly north. Not a problem. So a, whole, uh, a social holon doesn't have a dominant monad. They don't have the capacity to make decisions. They have a dominant mode of communication. And so when we're talking about evolution, we can help an individual evolve, at least to the next step. We can help an individual awaken. Social holons don't awaken. Groups don't wake up. Individuals wake up. It's a function of, it requires a dominant monad to awaken. So the chances of getting a whole group to evolve short of something really radical happening 
that causes us to have to evolve or a brush with death that is so radical that it terrifies us and shocks us into something that would not normally happen. A freak of evolution, for example, are pretty slim. So I don't spend a lot of time hoping that as a species we're going to wake up. And I don't spend a lot of time trying to make that happen because it's not helpful. Hmm. So it's up to us as individuals. I work with individuals. I work with groups. I don't work with species. I don't know how to work with species. Beautiful. Dashin, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure again.